Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for uh, the interest in chatting. I think this sure. will be a lot of fun. I think so too. <clears throat> yeah, I um, just finished your paper, Technological Approaches to Mind Everything, uh, or to, sorry, to Mind Everywhere, uh, that came out last year and really enjoyed it. The more I read your stuff, the more I am kind of shaken free of some um, philosophical commitments that I think I had arrived at because uh, technology hadn't advanced to the point and engineering hadn't advanced to the point where there were, you know, experimental means of actually, um, you know, revealing the ways in which um, minds can operate on various platforms and just the way that you're redefining um, classical philosophical categories is, is, it's really, um, fruitful for me and forcing me to stretch, uh, and change some of my priors. And so I'm grateful, uh, to you Amazing. for that. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great outcome that I could have hoped for with, uh, with these papers. So thanks. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what precipitated, uh, this particular, um, conversation was, something I shared on Twitter about, you know, how the old definition of, of a machine has kind of been superseded and, but classically, you know, the difference between a machine and, and an organism had something to do with um, the, the relationships among the components, um, you know, Aristotle and Kant um, both recognize this, that in an organism in a living being there's a way in which um, the parts reciprocally produce one another for the sake of of the whole right and so there's a lot of implications there one is that there's a kind of purpose at play um, that tells the parts not only um, what to do to maintain some sense of wholeness at the level of the organism but also how to produce and relate to one another effectively maintaining themselves but it seems now that you know technology has advanced to the point where that kind of distinction no longer holds. There are machines which can, for whom um, their parts produce one another, and they can solve problems and they can pursue goals and everything like this. So we need to rethink these categories. But I wonder what else might be at stake when we make a decision about. Um, what, which metaphor and which which word to use. I mean, words have connotations. You, we can define words however we want in the context of a scientific field or a paper. Um, but for the broader public, I think a word like machine and a word like organism, they have all these connotations that relates, you know, there are ethical questions that are raised and so on. And so I wonder um, why, why might we want to go with uh, the term machine in this expanded sense, rather than talking about say synthetic organisms or artificial organisms or something like that? What are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so great. Um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll start just by saying that I'm 100% with you in that we really need to understand, and I think more than understand, but actually manage um, the consequences that our our uh, paradigms have for people and how they relate to each other in the outside world and that so so I do think that's very important I'm, I'm in no way trying to sort of avoid that and uh, I, I want to take a step back and think about what do we what do we want these words to do why do we have these categories why do we have these words what's the point point? and in particular I, I come to it in the belief that as, as scientists and philosophers rather than trying to sort of shoehorn things that we find into colloquial usage. I think we're, we, our job is to be the tip of the spear. I think we're supposed to lead. And, and that means that at some point there will be a situation and as there is now, and then people say to me, but you know, that's not how most people use that word. And so you've got two choices. You can use it the way most people use the word, or you can say, no, actually, this is how we should be using the word. And someday everybody else will catch up. But we as scientists and philosophers are supposed to improve that situation and, and, and hope that people catch up. So, so, so I, I believe that. And so well, both of those things, right, that we're supposed to do a better job of providing categories for people in order so that they may have a more healthful relationship with themselves, with everybody else, with the planet and so on. 
So in doing all of that, one can ask, uh, what do we want these words to do? Why, why, you know, why do we have words like machine organism and so on? And I, I will make the claim that I think what these words are supposed to do is tell the, you, uh, the listener of, to whatever, of, of whoever is, is using these words, what kind of relationship is optimal with a given system. In other words, when you tell me that something is a kind of system, it's a simple machine or a more complex machine, or it's a learning agent, or it's a, you know, it's a human person, or it's a, some other kind of person or whatever, what you're really telling me is what kind of a relationship can and should I have with it? You're telling me really, and this is what I want to hear, um, what, what, what I want to hear about a new system is I need to understand what kind of relationship is possible and what kind of relationship ethically am I supposed to have with it, right? If I want to maximize the, the ethic. So I want to maximize the efficiency of our interaction and I want to ma maximize the, the ethical value of our, of our interaction. So to me, all of these words are operational protocols. What, what I hear when you tell me that something is, and so um, do you mind? I have uh, I have a couple of slides that uh, that I that I produce for this purpose. If you don't mind, uh, um, I can share. Yeah, cool. Uh, I will share the screen just to just to show. Um, let's see. Uh, this is this is the thing that I want. I well, there's a couple of slides I, I want to show. So this is so this is one. So so if we consider this kind of spectrum, right, with with simple machines down here, and then you know sort of cybernetic devices that can have set points and so on, and then some learning agents uh, up here, and then some some rational planning agents and so on. When you tell me that a given system is this kind of machine, or it's this kind of this agent, or it's this thing or this thing, what I hear is ah, what you're telling me is the way I'm going to interact with it is using a particular set of tools. And you can go wrong in either direction. So you can spend a lot of time being angry at or trying to convince a mechanical device of something, and that's a huge waste of time, and that's very suboptimal. Or you can try to, to treat these systems using the tools that you would normally use for this system. And that leads to terrible moral lapses. And in fact, when people say, um, uh, and, and, and so, and so uh, what, what, when, when people say by, by uh, attributing degrees of agency to um, all, all kinds of um, sort of unconventional systems, you know, cells and organs and whatnot. People say, oh, that leads to terrible, that's a slippery slope that leads to a terrible kind of, you know, primitive animism. I usually say that, no, actually the slope is much slippery in the opposite direction. It's, it's much worse when you start to uh, treat these kind of agents as if they were this kind of agent. And so, so my claim is two, two, twofold. One is that this is a continuum. So I, I, think, I think if we try to do binary uh, categories such as this is a machine or it is not a machine or it is something else, we end up with pseudo problems that are unresolvable. I think we have to accept that this is a continuum. And in fact, this continuum is, is, is getting um, sort of richer and richer all the time. And not only that, that the answer to where, how should you relate to these various machines is an empirical question. It isn't something that you can have philosophical feelings about it from an armchair. It's something that you actually have to find out because many systems that you think of are here, in fact, can be handled with some of these um, some of these techniques that are that are up here. So you don't know. And as you know, in our work on regenerative medicine, I can ask where do cell collectives in the body fit here? And people say, well, and some people will say, well, obviously they're molecular biological machines like this, you have to rewire them and that's it. And other people will say, um, you know, no, no, I, you know, your body has, uh, has, has all kinds of intelligence and it, and it does this and that, and you know, it's probably up here. We don't know, you don't know until you've done the experiment. So I think this has to be an empirical thing. And I think the question here is, it's all about relationships. It's all about what kind of effective and ethical relationship you can have with many of these systems. What can you expect from them? Are you going to be treating them this way by physical rewiring? Are you going to uh, be having these kind of uh, you know, deep conversations? What, what, what can you expect from a, from a given system? And I wanna show you one other quick slide. I'm gonna um, say in advance, uh, if anybody, uh, if, if uh, and you can tell me if you, if you have a, um, a weak stomach, this is a, this is a um, uh, kind of a surgery picture. So if uh, we, can, we can cut this out, if anybody doesn't, uh, is you cool with it? Yeah, so, so okay, so, so here, you know, what, what, what are machines? Well, you know, machines are the kinds of things you fix with a hammer and screwdrivers and stuff like that. So here you go, this is, this is, uh, this is orthopedic surgery. And what you're seeing here are the two phases of this medical approach. In this phase, they're exploiting the fact that it, 
there are aspects of the body that absolutely work like relatively simple machines. There are physical forces, there are uh, tensions, there is a configuration of parts that you can not only interact with at a very low mechanical level, but in fact, it's interoperable with other simple things like these titanium bolts. And so, so they're going to use a hammer and, 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 and some chisels and a screwdriver, and they're going to use all of the tools that you associate with simple mechanical clocks. And, uh, and, and that is a, is a very effective way to interact with this body for certain purposes. Now, when you walk out of the office uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, you know, of the doctor who's doing this, then what do they say? They say, go home and heal. And at that point, all of this stuff, this is what it looks like weeks after. And at that point, what the doctor is relying on is the aspects of the body. They're not like a machine. The fact, all the homeostatic kinds of processes, all the stuff that it's going to do that we as, as, as uh, workers in, in re, let's say, regenerative medicine don't have any hope of, of controlling directly. You're relying on the competency of the body. For example, stuff like this, where it turns out that uh, even gene regulatory networks, very simple um, molecular circuits can actually learn. They can do associative learning. The, you know, they, they, these, these simple systems can do six different kinds of, of learning. So, the, so my point is simply that um, there are aspects. We don't have to be binary and say the body is a machine or the body is not a machine. No, there are frames used by different observers and those observers can be um, clinicians, they can be parasites, they can be the system, you, know, you yourself, they can be conspecifics, whatever. And depending on what you're trying to do, sometimes the tools uh, of, of simple machines are appropriate, sometimes the tools of cybernetics, sometimes of psychiatry. And so just at the, at the, the, you know, the last two things I wanna say, and then, and then I'll stop and we can discuss all this stuff, is that in medicine, all of, there, are, there are multiple approaches. All of this stuff it takes advantage of the machine-like aspects, which absolutely exist. Molecular biology is a thing. There are absolutely uh, machine-like aspects to us, but there's also all of these fascinating things that, that um, take advantage of the very high order kinds of uh, the competencies of, of, of living things that are not well captured with these tools at all. And so, you know, we try to sort of uh, identify what those are, but all this kind of stuff from behavioral science and, and you know, cognitive and neuroscience and, and, and so on. And, and then just to finish off with this idea that uh, we aren't the only things that the human, human engineers are and, and, and the clinicians aren't the only ones that like to hack biology uh, biology hacks each other all the time. So here's, here's a nice flat green leaf produced by the oak genome. And you would never know that it's actually capable of building this kind of crazy thing until this little, this little uh, bioengineer comes along. It's a wasp parasite and it delivers uh, certain uh, uh, prompts, probably biochemical, who knows what else, uh, prompts that, that uh, basically prompt the system to and, and hack the competencies of the system to build something completely different. This, this, uh, these, these amazing structures, which is quite different from what it normally does. And so, so there's engineering and hacking and, and hacking is a term that can be used not only for simple machines, but for complex machines. Hackers know this, they use, um, uh, you know, kind of social engineering in some cases to, to, to make people do certain things. And this, this works along the spectrum of agency. And then my last point is, is, is this, that, uh, pretty much any combination of evolved living material, uh, engineered material and software is going to be some kind of agent, right? In the next couple of um, decades, we're gonna be living with cyborgs and hybrids and you know, everything, um, I think I have a slide about this too. Yeah, yeah, every, every, every kind of, you know, not, not, only, not only the, the kind of the natural uh, uh, continuum of beings from little, little um, chemical systems like oocytes, eventually you get this, you get this agential glow by the time you get up here, or all, all of the different changes you can make technologically and, uh, and, and biologically. We're gonna be living with all of these things and we really need to give up these binary categories and we really need to give up the need to uh, sh sharply um, classify based on, you know, stuff like uh, your, 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 your origin story or what you're made of or anything like that. Uh, you know, we're well beyond that. So I will, um, I'll stop that. So that's, so that's my point. My point is um, these, these terms are uh, stand-ins for protocols, for, for relationship protocols. It's, there, there's nothing binary about this uh, that's going to be useful. And, and we just need to improve our, um, our ethical um, interactions with each other. And I think the sooner people get on board with this, and so and so, very few people are happy with this, right? So I get I get critiques from from like um, the the molecular mechanists who say 
you're dragging agency into this. It's, it's taken us backwards. Science has worked so hard to get away from goals and from mind and all that. And well, what are you doing? And then, and then I, I also get a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of unhappiness from organicists. And I consider myself an organicist, but they say, look, we've been trying for so long to explain why we aren't machines. You're, you're screwing it all up. You're, you're, you're now putting machines on the same spectrum. This is, this is undoing all the, all the hard work. And, and I think both of those are just, you know, they're, they're hopeless. This, this, the sooner people catch on to this spectrum of relationships, then the, the, the better off everything's going to be. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for, for leading us through that. Um, your approach, you know, basically as, as you put it um, in your tame uh, technological approaches to mind everywhere paper, you're searching for functional invariants that unify cognitive behaviors across levels. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, going all the way down to the principle of least action and all the way up to rational agents like Socrates, um, I mean, human beings, some of the time are rational agents that can be persuaded with, with reasons. Um, I thought also of like the placebo effect as a really profound example yeah. of this top-down yeah. way in which yeah. somehow w without our real conscious control, even we're just, you know, told that um, this, um, this pill or, or this procedure or whatever is going to help us in some way that's actually like deep in the metabolics yeah. of our yeah. biology and, and it works. It's like, yeah, you yeah. know, so these levels are connected and yet each, each layer has its own capacities uh, for problem solving, but they're able to communicate with each other yeah. across yeah. levels in some yeah. ways, right? Yeah. He, um, I mean, here, here's an amazing thing. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the placebo thing. It's very interesting. So F Fabrizio Benedetti, who I, I love his work, um, says this this phrase, he says, uh, words and drugs have the same mechanism of action. Hmm. And and the reason this works, right? So so I sometimes if I give a talk, I'll say, um, uh, to the audience, did you know that just with the power of my mind alone, I can control 30% of my, uh, my, of the, the voltage across 30% of my cells, like the, the potassium and, and sodium flows just with the power of my mind. And, and so, so most of the people say you're nuts. That's impossible. A few people are thinking like biofeedback yoga, you know, some sort of like special mind body kind of thing. No, this is what happens 24 seven in our body. When you just, when you make the high level executive decision in the morning to get up and go to work, the only one that's going to happen is if you depolarize your muscles to get up and walk. And so our whole body architecture, not, not in weird special times when somebody's in a high meditative state, no, no, it, all the time, we have a, um, a multi-scale architecture that allows high level uh, cognitive intent to filter down, to change the molecular events in your cells, that, to, to, to make a difference to what you're, to what the, literally the ions crossing your, your plasma membrane, because you have to depolarize those cells to move. So, uh, this is, you know, I, I think that the placebo effect isn't some, some weird, like rare thing. It's, it's how, uh, how our bodies work. It's, it's, it's the ability to, to, to cross those levels constantly. Like none of, none of this would work if that, if that wasn't the case. So um, I, I love all this stuff on, uh, you know, on, on the placebo effect and uh, uh, hypnodermatology, right? When, uh, when, you can, when you can try to sort of bypass some of the very top layers and try to communicate more directly with, uh, with some of the body systems. Um, yeah, all it, it's, it's, it's absolutely critical. And that, and it just tells us, right. There, there are parts that, that work more like simple machines and there are parts that work more like high level cognitive agents and, 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 and it's all part of the same system. Hmm. So one of the classical distinctions, um, that was drawn for thousands of years by philosophers between the machine and an organism, uh, has to do with the sort of locus of the the purpose that's active in in the system mm -hmm. um aristotle was already making this distinction the difference between um some kind of tool and an organism is that the 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 tool or, or the simple machines that they had um in ancient greece they're designed by an external agent and pieced together sort of from the outside um, so the purpose is imposed upon the form is imposed upon the matter if you want Whereas it seems that in organisms, um, the purpose is somehow intrinsic and there is no external agent separate from the system uh, itself. Now, you know, granted uh, with the information processing revolution, um, it seems that we can give uh, a machine its own goals, right? And so you, you, we can even have machine learning systems that, that establish their own goals. And so 
less and we're less and less able to make this distinction now because of these technological advances. And yet, um, there's a there's a paper a place in your your paper the the tame paper um, that I'll read a sentence here that raises a question for me. So this is uh, the bottom of page eight and top of page nine. You say there's nothing magical about evolution driven by randomizing processes as a forge for cognition. And, and here you're, you're arguing with um, people who, who would say that engineers can't possibly replicate what en uh, evolution can produce, right? So you say there's nothing magical about evolution as a forge for cognition. Surely we can eventually do at least as well and likely much better using rational construction principles and an even wider range of materials. And so there seems to me to be implied a subtle dualism here. I mean, I, I see how you could say there's a, a continuum between what evolution is doing at a very simplistic level and what we call rationality or reason uh, at the human level. Um, I, I assume you do think there's a continuity there, but in this case, it seems like there's there's the implication that that whatever rationality is, it can kind of step outside the system which produced it and redesign it, right? What's going on in that in that case? Um, yeah. If there is a continuity. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I wasn't trying to make a duality here. What I was trying to point, like like you said, I was I was I was arguing with the with the with the folks who say that what's what's special about uh, about uh, living things is that they they're you know they're, they're they're evolved naturally and 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 engineers can't can't possibly reproduce it. And I was trying to say that. Uh, you know, if if somebody said to me, uh, just for as a blank slate, somebody said, "Well, we've got this 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 random uh, uh, sort of uh, hill climbing kind of thing that the you know selection of the fittest and all that." So you know, pretty much a random process. Versus, I've 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 got some some actual engineers here who, by the way, can also use uh, genetic algorithm type of design. They do it all. The, you know, we do that all the time. Uh, who do you think has the better shot of producing cognition? Uh, you know this 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 random search or or like it's it, so 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 I don't see any reason why a combination of directed uh, design processes together with selection search whenever you feel that you need it couldn't do as at least as well as blind evolution itself. See, it, it's it's a funny twist because prior to 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 you know the Darwinian sort of uh, paradigm, it it would make total sense to say well, you know, God can do a better job than you engineers. Like, all right, I mean, I sort of, uh, you know, you could sort of wrap your head around why that might be. But once you've, once you've said, no, no, it's, it's evolution is where biology comes from. At that point, I say, well, engineers can do better than that, right? At, at least, at least as good as that. And so, and so that's all. I, I'm not saying that, um, that, that the rational uh, uh, kind of engineer is somehow outside of the evolutionary process. I'm just pointing out that as we have now, I don't. I don't think evolution has any any monopoly on on being able to produce cognitive agents. And I'm not saying that everything we do is a high level cognitive agent. You know, in terms of like like language models and stuff like that. Um, it's just I, I just don't see why we couldn't. I don't see why we couldn't do the same thing because because now that we've taken the the, the, the magic out of the the, the natural um, uh, evolutionary process, uh, I don't see any reason why we can't duplicate it and go beyond. Hmm. But I guess my. Um... What's interesting here, when we look at, you know, the last few thousand years of philosophy, philosophizing on these questions, there's been a tendency to think of reason or rationality as totally unnatural mm. um, and nature as something more or less designed by mm. a rational agent, by by God. And at, at some point in the modern period um, with the scientific revolution, you know, all the scientific um the the inaugurators of, of of modern science were deists of various kinds yeah. Yeah. but some maybe in the 19th century it's like the the hypothesis of god was just sort of deemed unnecessary and more and more we put ourselves uh as as rational agents and engineers in the place of of god not that we created nature but we can reverse engineer it and understand yeah. how a kind of mindless process could have produced it but still even in that sort of 19th century materialistic understanding um of of nature there's a dualism at play where somehow human beings are left outside of this process <clears throat> we have this rational consciousness that enables us to understand the whole thing and somehow whenever we make claims about nature and we say oh yeah of course we are organisms and we emerged out of this evolutionary process 
there's still this subtle sense in which we're not a part of that process um, mm -hmm. because often a materialist would want to deny purpose, deny agency, et cetera, to anything in nature. And yet the scientific inquiry, the, the, the process of um, uh, uh, seeking scientific knowledge itself presupposes agency. Um, yeah. white, one of my favorite quips from Whitehead, you've probably heard this by now, uh, he says, scientists animated by the purpose of proving that they are purposeless constitute an interesting subject for study, right? right. And so um, one of the questions, problems I'm really interested in is how do we square our scientific account of what nature is with the very conditions of the possibility of science itself? Like, how do we naturalize science, right, as a mode of inquiry? And I think your work with this, you know, pointing out this cognitive continuum um, in nature is one of the most um, compelling ways I've seen yet to, to do this because it's not philosophy. I mean, there's there's philosophical aspects to it, but it's really grounded in testable uh, empirical hypotheses, right? And so that's a game changer. Mm. Um, but we're, there's still such a temptation to think of rationality um, and our capacity to engineer as somehow not evolution. Yeah. We, we are evolution. Yeah. We, we are that process becoming aware of itself. And then there's a lot we don't know um, and remain ignorant of, but in some sense, we are evolution becoming conscious of itself. And so whatever tools we have to reach back and alter ourselves are just mm, amplified versions of what must have been there from the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, points in what you just said. Um, I'll pick up on on two things. One is that uh, you know this this teleophobia that has been around since the beginning of of the scientific enterprise to try and get rid of um, goals and things. That was that I I understand how that went before um, 1940s or so because because at that point there were really you know, there were humans and, and maybe angels that had goals. And then there was all this other stuff that was just kind of just machines, right? But since the science of cybernetics, we, we now have a non-scary, non-mystical, understandable account of the spectrum of goals. And if you uh, if, if, if you're having a, tr a problem with your heating system at home and your thermostat and you hire, a, you know, somebody to come fix it and they walk through the door and they tell you, I, 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 don't, I don't believe in, in goals in, in machines or you, they're not going to be able to fix your, 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 your thermostat because, because in order to understand the most basic homeostatic systems, you have to understand that the purpose of this, that this system has purpose, that it's going to expend energy to try to reach that purpose, that if you want to fix it, you have to be able to recognize where that purpose is recorded, how it's read out, what is, uh, you know, if, if you don't believe in that, you, you're, you're useless in, in an engineering sense. And so, uh, you know, this, this thing where people um, try to deny goals and purpose, I think that, uh, I mean, you know, these are smart people, so I understand what what they're what they're doing. It's not that they're that they're never going to uh, um, be able to handle feedback loops and things like this. It's it's what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep from from the slippery slope that they see, which is that once you admit that it has purpose, then what if you go paint, uh, you know, human level hopes and dreams on it too? What's to stop you from from having you know from recognizing a spirit under under every every brick? And so my point is. We know how to handle that in science. That's called empirical experiment. So if somebody says this thing has a goal, you say, great, draw me, draw me a model of, of what the space it's working in, what goal it's, uh, it's producing, and um, what competencies it has to reach that goal. And then we will go and test it. And, and if that model allows us better prediction and control and a more, uh, more a richer relationship with the system, then that's great. And, 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 you know, and painting hopes and dreams onto rocks doesn't do that for you. So we know this, this is not, this slope is not slipperier than anything else. We, we, we have ways of dealing with it. So, so I, I think that that teleophobia has got to go. Uh, that's, that's kind of first. Um, and the other thing is, uh, shoot, I just lost my train of thought. Um, what was the other thing after, after that you had said, uh, what was the other thing you said? Oh man. Um, that yeah rationality must be somehow continuous oh oh yes 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 that okay right right so so the other thing is this um so i'm definitely 
uh, not arguing for a dualism of, of of rationality in that sense. But there is an interesting thing here, which I, I don't know. I, th I think you'll you'll resonate with this, which is which is this um, that that it, that is may maybe a kind of a kind of dualism, which is this. Um, Imagine that uh, you evolve a, a voltage sensitive ion channel. So it's this ion channel that, that opens in certain voltages. What you have there is a transistor. You have a voltage gated current conductance. That's, that's a transistor basically. If you have a couple of these, you can make a logic gate. When you make a logic gate, you get a truth table. Now, what that means is you're starting to crawl up onto the basis, like the, the very elements of rational logical thought, right? You're getting truth tables. That truth table, you didn't have to evolve that truth table. You didn't have to go through all the work of evolving the components of that truth table. That truth table is given to you as a free lunch by as soon as you've made a simple machine that's able to implement it. There are many other free lunches like this, right? So, so there are the laws of geometry, of adhesion, of, of computation, of, of mathematics, uh, all, all of these things. You know, I talk about this, this, this dumb example of trying to evolve a triangle. Yeah, you, you, you spend a bunch of generations getting the first angle, right? And then you, you spend a bunch more generations on getting the second angle, right? But guess what? Now you don't need to evolve the third angle. You know what it is. It's, you get that for free. And, and so, so this isn't some philosophical thing about, you know, the platonic space of mathematical truths. This is really practical. Evolution just saved one third of effort. It, 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 why? How, how did that happen? And so, and so that, I think, is, is absolutely real, is that <clears throat> you're, you're able to interact with these really useful affordances that, uh, and, and so you can even imagine, I, I, I think there's, um, and this is, this is all, you know, conjecture, but, but, but I'm working on this stuff is to imagine that what evolution is actually doing in, 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 in producing these, these various, um, various forms that are, that are um, successful is it's actually searching through uh, 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 pointers into this kind of space of the of these of these affordances that can that can be used with with minimal effort to uh exploit it you know the the minute you you have a particular simple machine with a fulcrum why now you get to use archimedes all the principles of archimedes simple machines and then you get the ion channels great now you got a truth table and you can compute logic functions like amazing what well, you you didn't have to you didn't have to evolve all the pieces of that so so that's that i think is interesting and the only other person i've heard talking about that in um at all in this in this kind of biological context is Andreas Wagner. So Andreas Wagner, uh, you know, re really interesting thinker. He's got a bunch of good work um, on molecular evolution, and he's got this book, um, Arrival of the Fittest, where he asks this question, you know, like, okay, selection is great, and you get to weed out all the all the all the bad variants. W where do the good ones come from? Mm. And so and so he's he's got some some interesting ideas on so you know these these deep these deep principles that are um, you know I, again I, I would I would call these things free lunches that uh, you know and uh, Stuart Newman um, calls them these inherencies and so on that that you get to exploit and and that there's a little bit of a dualism there I think in terms mm. of right in terms of if you really believe that the truths of mathematics are hanging out in some some inaccessible space that's definitely not this physical space. Then there, there's something to that, uh, and and I think there is something to that. Yeah, I mean, I think of other theoretical biologists, um, Brian Goodwin, mm. the late, late Brian Goodwin, Stuart Kaufman. I mean, his yeah. his notion yeah. of the adjacent possible and yeah. order for free and whatnot. There is a way, and and Whitehead has makes room for this too. He has a basic uh, polarity, I would call it, instead of a dualism between mm. um, actual occasions and eternal objects. Um, <clears throat> eternal objects are like these possibilities that are related to one another mathematically, but they're all other sorts of qualitative eternal objects for colors and tastes and, and the whole sensory continuum. And there's a way in which evolution is um, this process of remembering what worked in the past and, and building up um, um, a kind of repertoire of uh, uh, responses um, that enhance survivability but also if we're going to grant some sort of a panpsychism here that they're also a sort of um evolution is trying to preserve those experiences those those capacities which which lend themselves to more joy um and and more intensity in an aesthetic sense right so that's also part of what's driving this evolutionary process but then there's also this domain of possibilities everything that hasn't yet been actualized but there's some order to that realm of possibilities. I mean, this yeah. is why mathematics yeah. is so profound <clears throat> and, and organisms seem capable of whitehead's word is ingressing 
mm. uh, these possibilities mm. and you know the language around the, the, like the difference between causality and constraint and and these ways in which um, contemporary science is beginning to grapple with these issues um, Terence Deacon talks about absential features um, if mm. you've if you've read his book uh, Incomplete Nature it's the, the 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 role that what is not present plays um, mm. in what is what is actualized um uh John Pervakey has been trying to sort of revive Neoplatonism here by talking about this interplay between emergence which yeah. science has a good handle on and emanation which would be another way of talking about the ingression of form mm -hmm. um into actual physical um processes uh and yeah. so it's it's a kind of dualism but it's also just I think of it's almost like a function of the nature of time. If 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 we reject the kind of block universe idea, which I mean that's a whole other conversation. But if we think that the future is not yet actualized and that there's a real creative advance underway, um, then there is this kind of tension between what has already occurred and what is has not yet occurred but could occur, yeah. right? And so when we think of the space of possibilities or these eternal objects, I think in a platonic paradigm, this ancient view where they fully recognized this duality, it was more like, oh, well, there's there's time and becoming, and then there's just this vertical dimension of, of you know, pure perfection and, and form. In an evolutionary paradigm, though, we can think of this more, I think, in terms of the past and the future, right? The future is this um, not yet determined fully uh, open space of possibilities, but the, given what has occurred in the past, up to this point in the evolution of the universe, there are certain aspects of the future which are more probable than others. Um, and there are certain possibilities that we can't really reach from where we are right now, right? And so there's a, there's a kind of subtle structure to the future, but it's not yet fully determined. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. as evolution advances, it's exploiting um, these possibilities, which again, are ordered um, in and of themselves. Otherwise, math would be meaningless. Uh, and yet, before they are actualized by, you know, some biological or or um, engineered system being able to exploit that order, they're just kind of almost waiting, um, waiting to be to be contacted. Um, mm. And they don't, they don't have yet a causal role other than as a kind of lure. Yeah. It might be part of how we think of what a telos or an aim is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And and the stuff that that I've been uh, working and that none of this is, is published yet, but the stuff that I've been working on this on this uh, in this area, I think about a couple of things. I think about the structure of that space, as you say, right? So so yeah, it's definitely uh, wouldn't be a, a, a random mess. There are things that are connected with other things, and once you start indexing, uh, once you build machines that index. Into or or bodies uh, or something you know whatever that that indexes into that space you might have access to the to the to the other things that are adjacent in that space right at least you're getting close and and the other the other thing that I that I sort of intuitively think is going to be part of this model for now is I I think that stuff is under pressure like I don't think it just sort of hangs out there um, passively. I think I, I almost you know like in my head I sort of I sort of visualize it as this uh, like like almost like a like a gas that's that's under pressure and it's looking for uh, weak spots in the in the membrane to 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 sort of get get through right and if and if you're in in, in fact um I've got uh, I've I have a, a, an amazing uh, Jeremy Gay is this like amazing um, graphics uh, graphic artist that draws all of our stuff uh, I've got him working on this thing that's like you know, different, um, different kinds of uh, uh, beings that you're here are sort of, are sort of drilling away at this, at this membrane, right? And, and the first, the first spot where you make a hole, stuff is just like under pressure, right? It comes out. And I think that in, pr in practical terms, I mean, this all sounds, you know, very, very philosophical and very sort of, um, you know, like, like uh, uh, profligate, uh, you know, adding all these things, but, but I think it's actually very, very um, practical. Like, like these, for just for example, these xenobots, you know, or or, or just the synthetic organisms in general. Um, if you say, well, what is a xenobot? So I used to think that, you know, you could say you could say it's a biorobotics platform, or it's a protoorganism, or whatever. But what I actually think really now it is, it's a periscope. It's a it's a way to stick your stick stick a, a narrow search beam into that space and look around. Right? We've made we've made something that 
has stepped away from the standard, uh, let's say, frog, uh, you know, embodiment, and said, "Well, what's next to that? What else can this can this genome do? Like, what what are the other goals that these cells can undertake? What are the other um, set points and and ways of being, both 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 um, uh, somatically and behaviorally and physiologically?" Um, and and so by building these things and and using the exact same sort of genetic hardware to say, "What else can you do?" is is kind of like sticking a little a little periscope up there and, and looking around. You've got a little bit of a search beam, you know, the, the different radius and whatever. And you can look around and say, "Yeah, what's the what's the latent space around this thing? What else exists?" And try to br and try to bring that down. And once you've done that, you can take a next step and saying, "That's pretty cool. What else is what what else is this way?" Right? Yeah. So I, I, I yeah, I mean, this is this this capacity that human beings have to dip fully, almost more fully, let's say, into the space of possibilities is I think what makes us believe rationality is not natural. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you, you you have this notion of the cognitive light cone of different cognitive agents at, at every scale, and it seems that, you know, human beings are probably not um, the organism with the largest cognitive light cone, but we yeah, seem to have passed that. some kind of threshold. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, you could say hope so if if Stephen Hawking is right about the intentions yeah. of more intelligent aliens coming to visit. But yeah. we have we seem to have crossed a threshold where we can consider the universe as a whole. You know, we, we don't know exactly what the universe as a whole is, exactly where it came from, where it might be going, but we're, we're, we're literally imagining the whole shebang. We're, we're capable of that um, cognitively. And that not only are we capable of imagining like the whole actual universe, but we're capable of imagining, imagining many other possible universes, mm. right? And so this imaginative capacity to explore possibility space, uh, it, it affords us this capacity to rationally engineer um, ourselves and life on this planet. And, and it is very easy to convince ourselves that we're not that we're somehow out, like the, the periscope you're talking about, it's like we forgot that that actually we're still connected to this evolution yeah. process yeah. that that yeah. is that generated us. Yeah. Um, but, you know, philosophers yeah. of of nature throughout um, Western history, at least, and I'm sure in other traditions as well, have talked about this distinction uh, in Latin between natura naturans and natura naturata. And mm. it, it basically translates to nature naturing nature as process, as creative process, and nature natured, nature as a kind of finished product. Um, and the distinction here is between um, a kind of hidden aspect of nature that we can only intuit through our own imaginative and creative capacities. It's that which gives birth to new form. And then there's the nature that's already been born, as it were, and already taken shape. Um, and it's almost like nature fossilized. Uh, and when we only think of evolution in terms of um, naturata or uh, nature natured, it's very easy to think of it as just um, a, a random process of mutation being selected by a fixed environment and so on. And there's no way to really imagine where goals might come from or where the searching of possibility space might play a role. And so it's almost like there is a need for a kind of dualism. I prefer the term polarity here. Yeah. But there's definitely a, a dimension of the living world that's not something you can measure or weigh because it's almost implicit um, and hidden from that type of a materialist lens. And yet the very forms that bodies take are the kind of wake left behind this, this creative process of searching out novel forms and possibilities, right? And so I just, I feel like contemporary science and I think biology is really leading the way here. And actually, you know, your work with Chris Fields and others and, and um, Carl Friston and so on to like what we've, to take what we've learned from biology and agency in the biological world and then turn back to physics uh, and say, oh, wait a minute, maybe we can generalize from biology to help physics better understand the nature of self-organization um, and so on. Um, this is this is kind of similar to, to um, Robert Rosen's idea that like, mm self-organization in the biological world is, is is actually more generic than what physics has been describing and and mechanistic physics is kind of too special um and needs help from biology to come up with a more 
um, generalizable picture of of how nature organizes itself. And I, I think you know your work is really pushing pushing the envelope on this. But it's like we need to understand the physical world as having this this dimension that's hidden at least uh, from concepts like like mass and force and anything measurable um that that there's an intensive dimension that's necessary for the extensive dimension and all the measurable stuff and what what your work seems to be providing is an empirical way of sort of um uh, testing for the presence of this intensive dimension or this this goal seeking dimension or subjective aim would be whitehead's phrase for it that if you grant that dimension gives you all sorts of predictive capacities that you wouldn't otherwise have. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I, th I absolutely, I think it's, it's an intensely practical um, sort of thing. Um, one, one interesting thing, you know, you were saying about uh, kind of the human ability to kind of consider the whole universe and all that. So, so actually the cognitive light cone model itself has an interesting feature, which is that it isn't the, the radius of the, of the light cone, isn't the things you can think about. It is the, th the, the size of the largest thing you can actively work towards. And the, the distinction is, I'll just, I'll just give you an, an example. Um, we, as, as, as humans, and this is something with, 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 a, with another um, team of folks we study, we study some you know, re, re, similarities with some Buddhist ideas and so on. The, uh, we, we, in theory, we have the capacity to consider, like you can hold this thought in your head of all the people in, in, the, uh, in the world, like all of them, you can, or, or all of the living forms on earth, you, you can hold that thought in your head. But it's actually really difficult if you ask yourself, who, how many people do I actively, or how many beings do I actively care about? There's a, there's a linear um, range that flattens out because, you know, if, if something happens to, um, I don't know, 100 people and you feel a certain way about it, and then you find out that no, it's actually ten thousand people. You don't really feel, you know, that progressively that much str more strongly, right? Really, and then you find out that oh my god, it's you know, it's a million people, and you know, in poverty or whatever. Like you, you really flatten out pretty quick. You can't just and 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 so our current cognitive light cone has that limitation. But you might think that if you and and so the, these this, these kind of ideas we've been developing in the context of a bodhisattva vow or something where somebody says okay i am now going to commit to the goal of enlarging my cognitive light cone and someday maybe i will actually be able to care about all the sentient beings in the world in the linear range the way we can do right now with a small really, really a small number of you know for for typical humans just this, a small number of other beings so so i think that i think that even though we can have these sort of thoughts about the universe and all of that. And some people really are working towards, you know, world peace and, and you know, and, and what are the financial markets going to be a hundred years from now and things like that. Like, yes, we definitely have an amazing power. I mean, one of the things about us is that maybe uniquely some of our goals are longer than our lifespan. And that that's, that's a, that's a, that's a profoundly sort of disturbing idea. You know, if you're, if you're a goldfish, all of your goals are achievable because they probably last no more than whatever, 20 minutes into the future. And you're probably going to live that long. And so, right. So, so that's cool. Every, everything is, everything that you want to do is, is probably achievable, but for a human, you, you have goals that are for sure unachievable because you know, you're not going to live long enough to do it. And maybe, maybe there are some psychological pressures that go along with that. But, but, mm -hmm. but I do think that our cognitive light cone in the practical sense, especially in the, in, in what to, to, to me, what's important is, is the, uh, in the context of compassion and this idea of, right? Like how, how many other beings can you actually actively, you know, have as your, as your goal for, let's say, I don't know, improving their, their embodied right. existence or something. Yeah. So, so I think there's lots of room for us there. And I hope that, you know, that, that I, you know, I said, I hope we're not, that we're not this, the largest. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because I do hope there are beings somewhere that has, that have massive, you know, um, and, and of course some traditions claim that some humans have reached that, that stage. Right. And so maybe, um, but I hope there are beings somewhere that that have this just like enormous cognitive icon where they literally can care about just just tremendous numbers of other beings. You know, it's interesting to think about um, these levels of intelligence. Um, I mean, you lay them out uh, in terms of like you know um, uh, genetic transcription, morphos, uh, uh, genetic transcription as a, a domain where. Um, 
learning and uh, and goal seeking can play out and then morpho space and then the behavior of whole organisms and whole groups of organisms and so on. <clears throat> and you know Aristotle had his own sort of version of, of these levels when he would he would talk about uh, the vegetative soul and the sentient soul and the intellectual soul and um, yeah. part of becoming a virtuous human being is figuring out how to get them to to play nice together. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. We're not just disembodied intellects, right? We have emotions, we get hungry, we have sexual drives. And so it's like, how do you balance and find the the sort of um, ideal um, middle space or way of adjudicating between the needs and the goals of these various levels? Hmm. And when it comes to the stage of civilizational development that human beings are at, it seems to me like something is out of balance um, maybe our capacity for symbolic intelligence has become a bit um, disconnected from or a bit too isolated from or out of communication with the more biophysical aspects of, of our existence to the point where, you know, you think about the disconnect between our economic model and the carrying capacity of the planet's ecosystems and the way in which, like, symbolically, we can just go on making money, copies of money forever and forever. Um, but there are actually, you know, there's 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 an entropy problem here that there's a limited amount of free energy available on the surface of the planet. And so how do we keep an economy growing forever in that sort of a context? And I mean, that's 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 a whole other um, um, issue. But but it just seems to me that we are at this stage in evolution that might take place on other planets with intelligent life, you know, where there's a certain threshold that you need to cross, where if your technological capacities out too far outstrip your ethical your capacities for ethical reflection you end up in a situation where you just destroy yourselves um we seem to be at that kind of evolutionary bottleneck right now um where our tech technological capacities have far outrun our ethical and emotional capacities uh i would say and so when it comes to like how many people can we consider um as like ethical subjects that we that we care other ethical subjects uh, that we care about that that we find are uh, deserving of um, of our of our care. I mean, a lot of that depends on how much like sympathetic resonance we have with them. Like you know, we seem to be our circles of care very much depend on our our capacity for empathy. And when we're just dealing with numbers of people, it's like, well, I don't know those people i mean it takes a real act of moral imagination to be able to even fathom um you know 10 people who i don't know being harmed or, or killed right much less like you're saying when the numbers go up it's like it, it's immaterial it doesn't even matter if it's a hundred or a million um it's just a big number um and so you know when it comes to being able to kind of detect agency in organisms, um, whether they be humans. I mean, this is a question for human beings who are maybe in persistent vegetative states or otherwise disabled. Um, there's a spectrum of agency in human beings. I mean, addiction, for example, is yeah, definitely yeah. inhibiting our capacity for agency. And Absolutely. so there, I think it's so important the way you're making this <clears throat> kind of empirical question. Um, but it's also always an ethical question. Um, when you take the engineering stance and develop these empirical tests based on how well we can control a system, based on how much agency or not we're we're granting it, um, then it's it's yeah it's all about control, prediction and control, and that could operate at the human level, uh, and we can be very manipulative. And, and you know a lot of people who are sort of charismatic sociopaths that run um, corporations are very good at. Uh, manipulating other people's agency, you know. Um, and so the ethical questions, I think, are becoming more and more acute as our uh, scientific and technological capacities advance, right? And I'm really glad, you know, to hear you speak to this. Um, I was going to bring it up, but you brought it up for me. Yeah, um, yeah. We, we're entering a space where whether they're some kind of cyborgs or machine organism interfaces, um, machines with just enough human brain cells to really learn and 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 convince us that there's someone home, um, that's not that far away. And you know, I've um, I don't know if you know Marvin Minsky, um, his work. Uh, sure. he, he came to my 
uh, undergrad um, university, UCF, a long time ago, uh, it would have been like 2005 or something. And, you know, he was presenting at the time on his book, The Emotion Machine, hmm. and um, was talking about how he thought within five to 10 years that they would develop a machine um, that was indistinguishable from a human in terms of its conscious capacity and, and ability to um, engage in in behaviors that were seemingly intelligent and agential and so on. And I just, I asked him, you know, so are we going to pay these emotion machines for the work that they do? Do they get vacation time? Do they have rights, et cetera? Um, will they have mental health issues that we're going to need to worry about? Yeah. And he was kind of, um, he he seemed shocked that I would even ask the question. And he said, well, I'm a scientist. Uh, that's a, that's a problem for the politicians to figure out. Um, <laughs> and that kind of, it disturbed me a little bit. Hmm. Um, you know, not that scientists should not ask certain questions because they're afraid of the, I mean, afraid of the social implications or something like we need science to be able to advance with some guardrails, obviously. I mean, the whole eugenics idea was maybe not so good. And it seems like every scientist before World War II was like, yes, we definitely need to do eugenics. It's an important conversation to have the ways in which that sort of thing is happening anyways, just by virtue of class differences and so on with new technologies that are coming online. But like, how do you, <laughs> how do you grapple with the, the moral responsibility that comes with introducing these types of um, engineering um possibilities uh because it's accelerating so quickly now yeah yeah um well a couple a couple of interesting things then uh one is as you as you correctly pointed out focusing that whole spectrum on just prediction and control is potentially very problematic which is why i when when i brought up that slide i talked about optimizing the relationship because mm -hmm. Right, because that's a more general. So, so as you go, as as you get to the right, and and I sort, you know, there's also kind of some practicalities. When I first trotted out this system, I, this this scheme, I, I was trying to be very clear for the biologists that this is not philosophy. This is practical. You know, I didn't want to start talking about relationships in society, like, you know, that that stuff doesn't doesn't uh, go to the same audience. But, but. Um, but but it is it is the more general uh, concept here is relationship because when you get to the right of that spectrum, the reason that we prefer, you know. You, you, you're going to go to Mars for, for the next 30 years. What do you want to bring with you? A Roomba or another human, right? And the reason that, that, that we like hanging out with things on the right side of that spectrum is precisely because it's not all about direct control. We are benefiting from their agency by opening up and being vulnerable to it. And we're going to have a relationship. And that means sometimes it's going to do things we don't want it to do. And that's sort of part of the fun, right? You, you, you don't, you don't, uh, you know, you, you want your, you want your spouse to be on the right side of that spectrum and somewhat impedance matched with you as far as the cognitive light cone, you don't, you don't want it to be a room, but it's just that that's not the relationship that we're looking for. And, um, and, and in particular, and that's another interesting question we can talk about, you know, there's people working on certificates that are proof of human proof of humanity certificates, and we can get into what, it, what do you actually, you know, what, what is it about, what is it that you actually want, right, from these certificates? So, but, but, but yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. It's not all about prediction and control. It's very much about having the right kind of re relationship with it. And the other thing to uh, to kind of address is is uh, kind of the, the, the moral implications of this. So, so I think, I think uh, fundamentally, I, I, I completely agree that that everything we do, we have to as, as best as we can figure out whether this is a good overall a good thing to be doing. I think I think our, our ability to do that is quite limited, right? So it was the same guy that um, d d discovered ozone and leaded gasoline, and, and in both cases, all he was trying to do was prevent people from being killed by refrigerator explosions and gasoline, you know, early gasoline motors. He, he had no idea that this was going to screw up the the ozone layer, and you know, and, and we're all going to walk around with lead in our blood. Like, like sometimes you do things that, that look really fantastic. And so, so, so we have to be humble about the fact that you can't really tell all the time, but, but I also, I also feel strongly about the following that in, in the past, like pre, pre scientifically, um, you, you could have this view that this world is the best of all worlds. God created it for us and you scientists shouldn't mess it up. Like, don't do anything to make it worse. Things are awesome. This is a fantastic world. Like, don't screw it up. Right. That's but now I think and anybody who, who, you know, sort of can look around and, and see what's going on, you realize that uh, things are not awesome. Things actually are, are pretty bad for a large percentage of embodied sentient beings. I mean, I, 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 I'm not even a clinician. I get emails 
every day from people with the most unbelievable uh, medical conditions, you know, whether it's birth defects or something else, you know, we're susceptible to all this crazy, these dumb diseases and, and just these amazing uh, forms of suffering. And, and so this isn't some world that has been engineered specifically for us to make us happy. This, this is where evolution just happened to have dumped us. Right, this 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 meandering sort of search for for what does evolution search for? And I know you know, um, for example, I think Richard Watson doesn't agree with this, but but as far as I can tell, evolution just optimize optimizes for biomass. It's not optimizing for your happiness, your intelligence, your ability to fulfill some some sort of higher level on the Maslow hierarchy. No, it it, it just it's just looking for things that will likely to persist into the future. How, however, that persistence happens, however it feels from the inside. So so from that perspective, uh, the answer the 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 decision we're making as scientists isn't do I do this versus this this awesome uh, you know sort of best possible world. No no, it's uh, right now things are things are pretty terrible for a lot of beings. And doing nothing is as much a choice as doing something. And 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 people often ask me, you know, what what is my um, like what what keeps me up at night as far as a moral lapse? And and what keeps me up at night is if we fail to rise to the uh, duty, the moral duty to make progress and improve these things. Like doing like not doing this work is, uh, I think, going to have way more negative consequences than doing it. And. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously you have to be specific about what, but, but the kind of stuff that I'm talking about with regenerative medicine and, and, uh, and, and this kind of uh, bioengineering and so on, uh, because the alternative to that isn't, well, then, well, then everything will stay great as long as you don't screw it up. No, no, this is, this is untenable. I, I literally, the, uh, the, in the, in the, uh, I've, I've learned recently that, uh, there's this concept, uh, in, in Buddhist, uh, thought of, um, a, uh, an inauspicious birth. And the idea is that you just happen to be born in some sort of circumstances where you cannot make the progress that you want it or that you should make. So, so for whatever reason, either because you're in the body of a cat or because you've got some other limitation, there's something going on that, that you can't really like sort of rise the way that, that, that you otherwise would. And as soon as I heard that, uh, I was like, wow, every birth right now is an inauspicious birth because, mm-hmm. because this, is, this is ludicrous. We, 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 we senesce, we age. We we are susceptible to 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 these these ridiculous disease conditions. We uh we 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 end up with birth. We start out with birth defects. We end up with with these unfixable injuries from from slipping on a on a you know banana peel at some point. Uh, we have very limited IQs. We have brain degeneration. We have parasites. This is this is this is completely untenable as far as I'm concerned. This is we we have an absolute moral duty to to to, to fix this stuff. So so that's 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 kind of just my point is that I, a, a lot of people um compare it to this to this uh imaginary ideal and and no and i don't think that's the comparison at all Hmm. yeah no i i agree with that um i don't know how much time you have uh mike but uh oh man i i didn't even realize uh uh, i've got about about another 10 minutes minutes. okay great yeah i so like yeah the history of life on earth is just one one catastrophe catastrophe after the next i mean this is we, we seem to be entering the sixth great mass extinction event. And so humans can't take credit for all of the horrible things that have ever happened on the planet, right? Um, there have been five prior mass extinctions. And one of them, an example I love to point to, just to sort of um, challenge the idea that like somehow human beings in our rush to, to re-engineer uh, and, and, and um, you know, sort of scientifically tinker with, with nature that we're not the first to make a mistake, um, the oxygen crisis, mm-hmm. right? Um, anaerobic bacteria are producing this pollution uh, called oxygen nearly drove themselves into extinction. And yet within a few million years, um, an, a, a mutation allowed for an adaptation, which actually uh, allowed oxygen to become uh, fuel for more complex forms of life, right? We, we probably wouldn't have gotten multicellular animals without that um, oxygen without oxygen breathing to, to really kickstart our metabolism, right? And so what was pollution became um, a kind of fuel for more complex life. And so we can't think of um, the sorts of things human beings are doing on the planet now from just a, from a one, in a one-sided way. We don't know what we're doing and we don't know what life's capacity to, to evolve uh, and adapt uh, might be. That's not like a blank check for us to just continue to do whatever we want in terms of, you know, damaging ecosystems, but, um, it does raise this, this deeper question about how, how different 
human beings really are from what life has been doing from the beginning, sort of stumbling forward um, and and creatively finding solutions to problems that it created for itself. You know, I do I do wonder though if you know what's driving this evolutionary process uh, is just like um, persistence. I mean, Whitehead says the art of persistence is to be dead. Like rocks survive a lot longer than organisms, and so he has this view of like when we when we talk about evolution, what we're really trying to point to is this process whereby more complex organisms that are more sensitive but have less survivable survival power than the ones that came before them, and so it can't just be survivability that's driving this. I mean, that's obviously like that's that's um, the lowest common denominator. Like you you have to you have to survive. That's, that's step one. But then there seems to be this element of life, which is seeking to thrive, right? There's a, there's a deeper aim at play, which we experience at a very high level in terms of, you know, in, in different domains as, as, as like, um, this aesthetic delight and, um, some kind of religious aspiration that has something to do with immortality, which, you know, you've brought up Buddhism a few times. And I really think as we do understand the fabric of of life and our evolutionary history better i think something like reincarnation the kind of ethics of reincarnation will be revitalized because it just makes a lot more sense to bring into our cultural self-understanding some sense of our intimate interconnection with everything that's come before us and into the future like what we do the decisions that we make the agency that we exercise is going to have an effect and so there is something like karma right and reincarnation going on we just need to interpret it um in a more uh up-to-date biological way right but i i think i i can see this this recovery of ancient um ways of understanding uh our moral situation uh, occurring as a result of this new science yeah but yeah it, it seems to me that there's there must be something more driving evolution than just persistence right i mean don't well, so so I wouldn't. Yeah, so so I said it poorly. Um, and and by the way, I, I'm I'm uh, in, entirely possible that there's something else. I'm just sort of uh, talking about the things that uh, we can we can see it doing. And that and sure. given I'm a philosopher, so I'm a little more free willing with these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so so here's my here's my minimalist version of that. Um, it's not just persistence; it's the probability of being observed by another agent. So, 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 so yeah, rocks persist like gangbusters, but they don't make other rocks. And so the probability of being observed that particular rock will, but rocks in general, not so great. Whereas if you're a bacterium, oh man, uh, you know, you, lots of you will be observed at some point in the future. So, so you can sort of think about it that way, right? Th that the idea is uh, evolution is our way of describing systems that tend to uh, maximize themselves being observed later by some and you and you can sort of ask uh, the, this is I'm, I'm always interested in, in asking people this like what what, what exactly is evolution optimizing so so imagine imagine a, a, an empty planet this is like a star trek thing from one of the movies is uh you know and you sort of drop you drop in some minimal self-reproducing unit you go away you come back a couple billion years later what can you say anything about what you expect to see Right. Like as far as I can tell, the, what we know about evolution, the only thing you can really predict with any degree of certainty is that there'll be a bunch of cool stuff happening. Like that's about it. You'll, you'll have you'll have all you'll have all kinds of you'll, you. You as an observer will have will be kept pretty busy observing all the stuff that happens. That's it. Can, can we get any more complex than that? I mean, I really don't know that it makes any more specific predictions than that. I, I don't think we can say that there will be a bunch of happy agents. I don't think that we can say there will be a bunch of um, highly intelligent. Like, I, I don't know that we can know any of that um, other than there will be stuff to observe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm really fascinated by the ways in which, um, you know, what the medieval philosophers used to call the, the transcendentals, the, the good, the true, the beautiful mm. are very high level human expressions of, uh, of features of experience, which, which in simpler forms kind of go all the way down. I mean, this capacity for truth, uh, like truth tables that you were talking about, that goes all the way down, uh, to cellular communication and the ability to form logic gates. And, you know, this experience of, of beauty that, that, that manifests itself in human artwork and, 
um, and music and so on. Uh, you, you see that in certainly in the animal world in in sexual selection. I mean, that's operative there. And and um, the notion of goodness. I mean, you know, we can at least see in other other mammals some sense of like fairness and the ability to play and like the bigger ones won't totally dominate the smaller members of uh of their their group and so you know there's a way in which what seem like um these like transcendent uh ideals that 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 human beings or organize their societies around are actually rooted in the deep biological past um and i think that that it, when we begin, begin to really explore that possibility it does help establish these lines of continuity which which i think are really important at this moment in history and there's so many lessons to learn from um, the biological world about how human associations can function human organizations can function more effectively and the last point i'll i'll mention before we wrap up is um there's a an organizational theorist who studied with whitehead back in the 20s mary parker follett and I, I gave a talk last week to some business people drawing connections between your work on cellular intelligence and what she says about human association. And she wrote about government and uh, the corporate sector and really was just emphasizing that all decision-making is collective decision-making, like all intelligence is collective intelligence. There's no monadic self anywhere. All selves are, have components that compose them. And that the, the lesson here that is implicit in your work uh, for human beings that she makes explicit is that, uh, you know, when human beings come together to make decisions, we really get stuck if we imagine that our interests are simply self-interests because we're drawing a fake boundary around our sense of self, not realizing that um, selfhood is malleable. When we come into association with other human beings, we can form bonds, empathic bonds and, 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 resonate sort of interior to interior in such a way that the interests we arrived with change because our sense of self changes. And so if we're willing to be more flexible with that, we can begin to exercise forms of collective intelligence at the human level, which would totally revolutionize the way that we do uh, democracy, the way that we run our economies and would help us not, I don't think the idea here is to eliminate competition. That's not the, there always will be competition at different scales, but to bring more balance to this by not imagining that um, each human being is some enclosed sense of self that has uh, private interests that in no way can be transformed by sort of, you know, opening up a kind of gap junction with other human beings, whereby we begin to share the same sense of selfhood, right? And there's always overlapping and nested selves. Um, and so just softening these boundaries uh, that we think are natural, right? As though um, an economy that's running on the principles that nature runs on would involve just self-interested individuals competing with each other. Like, no, that's not actually how nature does it. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really interested in exploring these analogies and continuities between your work at the level of single cells and how that could uh, interface with, with human organizations, because I think mm -hmm. it could be really helpful. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Um, yeah. R Richard Watson uh, is another person that um, you may want to mm -hmm. talk to. He has, he has a lot of thoughts about that on the kind of uh, the, the boundaries on an interpersonal level um, and things like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, it was yeah, a lot of ground so in a little over an hour and yeah. Um, yeah, keep up the good work. Uh, awesome. I'm yeah. doing Thank my you. best to keep up with it. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, great to talk to you, Mike. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much for the conversation. Well, I'm sure I'm sure we'll have more. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. All right, take care. Take it easy. Thank you. See you.